Hello and welcome to Cerebrophile. I am Miss Raz and these are my big hands. And here we talk about all things cerebral. Just a quick disclaimer, there is going to be some brief discussion about our nether regions, our genitals. Today we will be discussing phantom limb. Our story begins with Tom. He was 17 years old and he was driving home from soccer practice one day and he was a little tired, a little hungry when somebody swerved into him on the road, slammed into him and Tom was ejected from the car. And he landed nearby on the street. Now Tom survived, but not unscathed. He lost his hand and said hand was still gripping on to the steering wheel of his car. He ended up losing his arm right above the elbow. This is where our story gets interesting. Even though he had no hand, Tom was claiming that he could feel his fingers. He still had sensations. He felt like they could still point and reach out for things. Obviously they couldn't grab it, but he felt it. And now some of you might be thinking, my goodness, he must have been on some strong drugs. Yeah, probably. But he's not the first to experience such things. There are other people out there that they will have to undergo an amputation and they wake up from the anesthesia and they are convinced that the surgery has not been completed yet because they can still feel their limb. Like, no, I have sensation there. Of course you didn't amputate it yet. Then they move the blanket and maybe show them their arm or their leg and oh my God, it's really missing. <gasps> Feeling your fingers and having those sensations, that's one thing, but you can also have other sensations like itching, clinching, maybe tingling. Worst of all, even in your non-existent arm, you may have pain, some phantom pain. So I keep saying phantom. What on earth am I talking about with this phantom thing? Phantom limb is a persistent image or memory of part of the body, usually a limb, for months or years after its loss, according to Oliver Sacks. Where did this term first come from? Well, back in the day, like 1800s, late 1800s, we have a Dr. Silas Weir Mitchell. He coined the term phantom limb because he was working in the Civil War, basically, with a lot of amputee victims. He performed quite a few amputations himself on these people. And it was very common for a lot of them to report that they were feeling these strange sensations. So he wrote a whole paper about it and he even had to do it under a pseudonym because back in the day, if you were talking about these phantom limb things, people wouldn't take you seriously. A lot of people thought this was just wishful thinking. People are making this up. What are they talking about? A phantom? Now there are a lot of stories. People were always losing limbs and there are countless stories in the literature for us to discuss. There was one of a particular man who had to have his arm amputated. A few weeks after his amputation, he started getting this like gnawing feeling. What is this? What is going on here? So he calls up his doctor and he's like, hey, what did y'all do with my arm? And the doctor's like, I don't know, call the surgeon. He calls the surgeon. What'd you do with my arm? The surgeon's like, I don't know, call the morgue. They're the ones that handle these things. Calls the morgue and the morgue is like, well, we usually incinerate them, but uh, your arm actually went to pathology. So he calls up pathology and pathology's like, oh yeah, actually we had like too many arms. So we just buried it in the back in the garden of the hospital. Do people do that? Do they still do that? Anyway, he needs to see his arm. So they exhume the sucker and when they pull it out, as you might expect, it's like covered in maggots and things. And he's like, that's it. That's why I have this gnawing feeling in my phantom arm. Let's burn it and everything will be fine. And according to lore, everything was fine after he burned it. So thus far, I have mentioned usually phantom arms, phantom legs, you know, appendages like that. But it's not limited to just your flailing limbs. There have been phantom appendices, phantom penises with their corresponding phantom erections and phantom uteruses, uteri with phantom menstrual cramps. Though these cases have been documented for really probably centuries to some capacity, we're still not completely sure what causes them. Some people think it's wishful thinking. Some people think it's 
these neuromas, which has to do with these kind of like scar tissue -y irritation of nerves, which not a crazy thought, but as we will see in part two of this video, you can have phantom limbs even when you were not born with said limb meaning you didn't lose it. You just never had one to begin with and you can still have phantoms. What mystery. Vyas Ramachandran, aside from having an outstanding name, is a neuroscientist at the University of California, San Diego. One day, he just became a little bit curious of phantom limbs, so he phones up his orthopedic friend and he's like, hey, yo, you know anybody who's lost an arm recently? And the friend's like, yeah, sure, I'll send somebody over your way. Enter again, Tom. Remember Tom? Tom was the one who, and was still on the steering wheel. Yeah. Tom has not had an arm for quite a while now. Okay. So he comes in. Ramachandran's going to like evaluate him. We all love a good evaluation. So he asks him, what's been going on? What do you normally feel? What kind of sensations you got going on? And Tom is like, well, it's really itchy sometimes. And sometimes there's a little bit of pain, but like the itching can get really intense sometimes. It's time for a little experiment. Ramachandran takes a blindfold, puts it on him, explains briefly what he's going to do, but he doesn't want to like tell him too much about what he's researching because he doesn't want to sway the results. He blindfolds him, then he gets a little Q-tip and he starts touching him with said Q-tip like here and here and here. And he's like, where do you feel it? And at first he's like, like right here, right on his cheek. And he's like, well, you're touching my cheek. And Ramachandran's like, anything else? And Tom's like, well, you know, I kind of feel like you're touching my phantom thumb. Mama Chandran is intrigued, obviously, who wouldn't be? And how about here? I mean, you're touching my lip, but I, I kind of feel it in my, my index finger on my phantom. And how about here? That's my missing pinky. That's my pinky. Okay. That's curious, right? Totally curious. So like, what else happens if you poke him anywhere else in his body? So of course, Ramachandran, being the scientist, he's like, what about here? And what about here? And what about here? Just my chest, just my shoulder, just top my head. Ramachandran does one more thing. He has a stump on his arm because he's missing his hand. And he again, starts kind of poking around the end of the stump. And on the stump too, he's like, hey, I kind of feel my thumb again. I kind of feel my pinky. What on earth is going on here? He can feel his thumb when you touch his cheek. He can feel his pinky when you touch his chin. He can feel his thumb and pinky when you touch his arm. What's going on? What is going on? For Ramachandran's final trick, he gets a little Q-tip and he dips it into some water and he just runs it along his cheek. And he asks him what he feels. Of course, he reports, you know, I feel some water on my cheek. But then he says he can feel it dripping down. He feels water dripping down his non-existent, his phantom limb. Isn't that crazy? So just to review, Tom has no hand. He's missing a hand. When you touch Tom's face, like his cheek and his chin, he feels his thumb and his pinky. When you touch his stump, he feels again his thumb and his pinky. He even feels water running down it. If it runs down his face, he can feel it running down his phantom limb. What is going on here? You come up with your own thoughts and hypotheses while I work on this drawing. I will be right back where we will talk about what's going on in the brain with phantom limb. Roll that time lapse. Welcome back. Now it's time to bring out 
the brain. So what is going on with Phantom Limb? First thing we need to be acquainted with is our somatosensory cortex. The somatosensory cortex is about right here. Soma from somatosensory means body and it's Greek. The somatosensory cortex receives information from the body, from all of your senses. So if you were to touch your forearm, there's a part of your brain that's going woo and lighting up and feeling it. This is a whole area, right? We have a whole strip of this somatosensory cortex. So the somatosensory cortex doesn't handle your entire body like one big lump. There are specialized areas. Now you might think that every part of your body would have equal representation throughout the brain. Not so. There are certain parts who have basically bigger real estate, bigger land masses, a bigger area. Which parts of the body do you think have the largest representations? Basically, which body part has the biggest real estate in your brain? Maybe you have a couple ideas, but I have something for you to try. Go and find yourself a buddy and go and get maybe two chopsticks or two pencils or two pens, make sure they're not too pointy, and Go and try this. Try it. Find yourself a buddy and carefully begin to poke them in different parts of their body like the back of their neck. Here, he was incorrect. There were two chopsticks. This is one chopstick. He got that correct. Trying two again. And incorrect. Continue doing this on different parts of the body like the forearm, hand, chest, and any other places that you and your partner feel comfortable with. Keep a tally and compare your final scores. What are the differences in sensitivities? What body parts were you most accurate with? Hopefully that was fun. Now, why would certain parts of your body have different sensitivities? And by extension, they're going to have different sizes of real estate in your brain. Let me show you what your body would look like if it was a one-to-one -one correspondence with the way that your brain represents it. Ta-da! He's a little funny looking. <laughs> this is the homunculus. Homunculus means little man. What do you notice right away? He has huge hands and huge lips. Why do you think that those areas would be the biggest? This little man is fun and interesting, but how does it relate to what we're talking about, about phantom limbs? We just saw a representation of the body if it was completely proportional to the amount of real estate it takes in the brain. So how do you get a whole body in just, remember, one little strip of brain? Remember, our somatosensory cortex goes about right here, about yay thick. Well, how do you put a hand in there, a head, a foot, a knee? Where does all that go? Do you just organize it from head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes? No. How did anybody figure that out? Enter Penfield. In the 1940s and 50s, a Wilder Penfield came in to the picture. This is how it's actually ordered. This is the cortical homunculus. The cortical homunculus has different representations of different parts of the body. Look at the areas. Are there any things that you notice right off the bat? Certain body parts are not directly next to the area you'd expect. So we have a hand here, and that hand is close to the eye, nose, face. How did Wilder Penfield figure this out? Well, you get a person, you pop open their skull, they have their brain all exposed, and mind you, there are no actual sensory bits in your brain. So if I were to go, you probably wouldn't feel it. But what he would do, expose the brain, and with a small electrode, he would go, what do you feel? And the person would be like, oh, my knee itches. And then he'd like poke a different spot. And they'd be like, oh, I feel something in my mouth. And that is how the cortical homunculus was actually mapped by just, isn't science great? You just go in there and poke things. So you'll notice from our homunculus map, the hands and the mouth are the biggest areas. Why do you think that is? Think of all the things that we do with our hands in a day and your mouth Think about babies. What do babies do with everything? The mouth has so much sensory information packed into it and the brain has a lot of real estate dedicated just to the mouth. Now, how does this relate to our phantom limb questions? Again, notice how 
there is not a one-to-one -one correspondence in the amount of area that a certain body part gets in your body, and they're not in order of the way a body is mapped out. This arrangement of different body parts in the brain is called somatotopic arrangement. Also notice that the foot is the thing that is closest to the genitals, not the thigh. Fun side story, there was another case, a female graduate student who had lost her leg right below her knee and she called Dr. Ramachandran and she was like, Doc, something really strange happens to me when I have sex. And he was like, well, what, what is it? Every time I have sex, I feel these strange sensations in my phantom foot. I never wanted to tell anybody because it's so weird. But when I saw your diagram, she's talking about the homunculus, I knew exactly what was going on. Now look at the homunculus again. Where's the foot? It's next to the genital. Another similar story. Doc, every time that I, you know, have sex, I kind of feel something funny in my phantom foot. And Venus Ramachandran's like, it's fine. It's just because those two areas are linked in the brain. The guy's like, no, you're not listening to me. Like, I have my orgasm, like in my foot. And it's like even bigger and stronger now because it's my whole foot and not just my, you know? There is some speculation that the cortical arrangement of your body parts may explain why there is such a thing as foot fetishes to each their own. Back to Tom again. He didn't have any uh, strange sexy time moments, but he did have, remember, some phantom itching and occasional phantom pain in his hand that he lost. Dr. Ramachandran, who was, as you might imagine, pretty excited about his interesting findings about touching the lip and feeling the finger and all that good stuff, he had asked him, after their first meeting and after he'd kind of gone home, did he feel any other interesting sensations or any differences going on? To which Tom responded, no, I haven't. But you know, my phantom still just really itches sometimes. That's kind of annoying, but at least now I know where to scratch. And that is the end of part one of Phantom Limb. I do hope you'll join me for part two, where I will discuss more interesting case studies and a brilliant, elegant, simple, intervention technique for those with phantom limb pain developed by Dr. V.S. Ramachandran. And here is our final result for our painting of the day. We have a brain and a phantom limb. You can see that the connection has been broken between them, yet the phantom still exerts some sort of control, gripping onto that somatosensory cortex. Thank you so much for watching this part one of Phantom Limb. I do hope you enjoyed it and will join me for part two. Do those liking, commenting, subscribing things so you know when the next one comes out. I hope to see you again. Be peaceful, be present, be grateful. See y'all next time. Bye. Okay. Oh, ah. To do the color in the background. Just do it, just do it. <laughs> Use the right blue. It's not the right blue. Use the other blue. I ask you this, my dear cerebrophile. What areas? Let's say that there's an area. Wow, that painted on it. Oops. This is the cortical homunculus. The cortical homun. Cortical. The cortical.